Hey guys, my name is Ali al Karagouli. I am a systems engineer and a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. I also graduated my bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical engineering. In this video, I'm going to explain to you the most important skills for electrical engineering. And I'm going to do this um, using the following outline. I'm going to go over the technical skills that you need to become a very good electrical engineer, the base knowledge, the fundamental understanding, such as electromagnetic theory, circuit theory, Smith charts, what do these things mean? Don't worry, I'm going to explain it to you very briefly. The basic software you need to learn as an electrical engineer and the software that you need to learn based on which subfield you're interested uh, in pursuing. And then once I explain those skills to you, I'm going to explain how you can go about learning them. After that, I'm going to go over soft skills, which are very, very important. And basically, these are the skills that are going to help you get the job, operate in the workforce, um, and then how to go on about acquiring those soft skills. And once uh, I teach you how to acquire all the technical skills and all the soft skills, and now you are ready to become like a Nikola Tesla tier electrical engineer, I'm going to finally explain to you in this video how you can go ahead and showcase those skills in a nice resume and LinkedIn profile. So this video is going to be very, very stacked. But uh, if you watch this till the end and if you gen like genuinely absorb what I'm about to tell you, uh, you will become a superstar in electrical engineering. There's no doubt about that. So... I want to first start by explaining very basic knowledge that you need to understand as an electrical engineer. The very first one, I call it base knowledge zero, before we even get started with electrical stuff, is mechanics. You need to have a very good understanding of physics. And right here we have this, you've probably seen this in your physics classes. Uh, this is a very important problem to understand. If you don't know how to solve this, uh, there's like you, you're not a good engineer. And don't worry, you can learn how to solve this. It's very easy to learn how to solve this. But basically, there's there's one one idea behind this question is you have this box of cookies and it's going down this ramp and you're trying to figure out, is it going to tip? Is it going to slide? Or is it going to stay in place? And all that comes down to is your understanding of the forces that are acting on this box and whether which force is stronger than the other. So this problem has nothing to do with cookies or ramps or mechanics or Newton's laws or any of that stuff. The reason this problem is very, very important for you to understand, this problem teaches you how to think and solve problems and isolate variables. Like in this case, you need to first ask, what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to figure out? Are we trying to figure out this thing's going to fall? Is it going to tip? Well, there's no dimensions here, so I cannot calculate the moment. So there's no way for me to find out if it's going to tip. I was going to ignore that. Then the question becomes, is it going to slide? Is it going to not slide? Um, and then you basically go ahead and calculate the forces based on how much mass this thing has, based on the force of gravity, based on the angle. And then you make a decision on whether is, this thing is going to slide or not, not slide. Again, very important problem to understand because it has nothing to do with mechanics, has nothing to do with, with physics. It has everything to do with, am I an engineer who can sit down, stare at a problem and not panic and, 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 and be calm and say, okay, what are we trying to achieve? What are the variables? Which variable am I solving for? Can I isolate that variable? And then I go ahead and I solve and I isolate that variable. And then I make a decision on what, what's going to happen. I make a prediction on what's going to happen. That's what you're going to get paid for as an engineer. You're going to be getting paid to predict how things are going to behave based on your understanding of physics. Now, once you cover mechanics, you go into something way cooler, which is electromagnetics and Maxwell's equations. Uh, these are the four equations that determine all behavior uh, related to electricity, at least on the, on the scale that we use in, in, in terms of technology. And there's four equations. They're actually very, very simple. First one is Gauss's law and tells you that if you want an electric field, or, or let's, let's look, at, look at it the other way. Think of the right side as the cause and think of the left side as the effect. So in this case, I have this row here, which is my charge density. This is basically saying if I have a, a piece of charge, if I have charge sitting here, at the tip of my finger, that charge is going to exert an electric field. That electric field is going to diverge, right? But then here, it's telling me that my magnetic field, uh, the, the, the divergence of the magnetic field is equals to zero, meaning the magnetic field cannot be caused on its own. Magnetic field is not caused by a charge on its own or by a monopole. or there, there's, no, there's no single thing that's causing a magnetic field to happen. A magnetic field has to be caused by something else. And then this is basically telling me that by changing a magnetic field, I'm able to induce an electric field. And likewise, by changing an electric field or passing current through a wire, then I'm able to induce a magnetic field. Uh, basically, all this is, is to say is that all electricity comes down to charges, moving charges, 
and electric fields and magnetic fields that change based on the behavior of these charges and the behavior on the fields, okay? So all you need to understand in regards to Maxwell's equations and electromagnetism is that electric fields are induced by charges. If I take the charge and I move it around, I'm gonna create a magnetic field. And then as my magnetic field is changing, that's gonna create an electric field. And then as the electric field changes, that creates a magnetic field again. And this spiral of electric magnetic fields creates something called electromagnetic waves, which is what your cell phone uses to communicate. We're going to talk about that later. So anyway, in summary, Maxwell's equations are very important. You need to basically understand charges and fields, okay? Um, the next thing you need to understand is circuit theory. You need to have a very good understanding of circuit theory. And if I show you this very basic circuit with some voltage and I have a bunch of resistors, um, you need to be able to tell me how much current is going through the entire circuit, how much current is going through resistor one, resistor two, resistor three, that's the very basic form. The more advanced form is once you get into more intense amplifier circuits or where you start looking at transistors, you start looking at capacitors. And in this case, there are no inductors, but there are no transformers. There's even more sophisticated electronic components. Uh, there aren't any diodes I see in here. Uh, there's all these uh, electrical components. How do they operate? And again, how is the current behaving? Where is it starting? Where is it going? And what's going on over here by the time my current reaches this uh, speaker, for example, uh, it's being amplified. Why do I have all these resistors? Why do I have all these capacitors? I need to have a very good understanding of circuit theory for sure. Third thing you need to understand, especially if you specialize in RF or microwave is a Smith chart. And basically <laughs> this is this very terrifying looking thing. Don't worry, it's not nearly as scary as it seems. All this is basically, if you're using RF circuits, basically circuits that are operating at non-DC at alternating currents, uh, you need to understand the matching of these circuits. Uh, is the circuit in phase or is it out of phase? Is it open uh, or is it closed? And you basically use, um, I don't know, like you use stubs, you change the lengths of the wires, you use capacitor, you use, use inductors. There are techniques that you do to move this dot here around the Smith chart. And what, ideally where you want it to be is you want it to have uh, to be dead in the center. And again, all that does is it basically ensures there's no loss, there's no mismatch in phase and it makes sure that your circuit is operating very well. Again, do not let this terrify you. You will learn this in your RF uh, microwave classes if you choose to specialize in that. But this is a very important thing to understand and that um, circuits that are not DC and that are high frequency AC, they need matching. And the way to do the matching is to use the Smith chart. Now that covers the base knowledge, right? That is basic physics that you need to understand. So you need to understand mechanics, electromagnetics, you need to understand electronics and circuits, and if you specialize in RF, microwaves, antennas, things that electromagnetic waves in general, you need to understand Smith charts. Now let's talk about basic software that you need to learn. And uh, in this case, there's one software you absolutely need to learn. Every single electrical electronics engineer needs to know the software and it's MATLAB, MATLAB, MATLAB. And if you don't know what MATLAB is, it's basically uh, like, let me show you what the user interface looks like. It's basically like a very giant uh, complicated Calcul calculator. And um, this is basically what it looks like. Oh, I can't zoom in on that picture. But as you can see over here, it's a tool where you can write scripts. So here you can write code and then you can plot things. And it has a really nice GUI, graphical user interface. And you can, you can uh, um, define variables very, very nicely. You can tell it to plot things and then you can like label your plots and whatnot. And it has very powerful features and functions already built in to help you visualize how things behave. Now, the reason MATLAB is very, very important is because in every single branch of electrical engineering, you're gonna need to simulate things. You're gonna need to figure out how um, things are behaving mathematically and in physics. And all this is showing is some behavior of some sort that is defined by some type of function. So I'll give you an example. When I'm designing an antenna, like let's say I'm doing a horn antenna design, I go on and I use MATLAB to calculate the dimensions and simulate how that behavior looks like. If I'm trying to figure out a signal processing algorithm, a filtering algorithm, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use MATLAB to figure out how that happens. If I'm trying to calculate how power is distributed across something, I'm gonna go ahead and use MATLAB to figure out that, that thing. So it's really like a general purpose um, program that helps you plot things and calculate things and run functions. And it's just extremely, extremely important. Like there's just so much you can do uh, with MATLAB. It is absolutely important. If you don't know how to use it, don't worry, you can learn it very easily. Also, MATLAB has like a really nice like support community. Um, 
over here and then like you can you can you can like any type of function that you don't know how to use matlab is really good at using for example how do i plot let's say uh how do i plot 3d in matlab uh and then you can literally go and see the support it literally give you the different functions you can click on them and it's going to show you what to happen it'll even give you some basic code that you can go and plug in and then you can run it in this case this is showing a helix so one thing i really love about matlab as well is that all the functions uh, are so well defined so well documented there's countless examples of everything and the online community and support is amazing so if you don't know how to use matlab and you're an electrical engineer or an electronics engineer you're missing out on some really cool stuff now that's kind of general software let's go by subfield let's go by based on what you decide to specialize in uh, if you want to go into electronics then you need to learn something called multi-sim uh, multi-sim also has another sibling called lt spice and all multi-sim does is basically help you simulate circuits right so instead of going and building the circuit which I, you still need to do at some point but suppose you want you come up with an idea or you're curious how something behaves or, or, or for example, if I if I were to go back and show you this example right here of this circuit, and you and you're curious about what the currents look like in each part of the circuit, instead of going and building this in person, you can go and simulate it on something like multisim, and then you get to uh, calculate the behavior of all the currents, voltages, and things of that nature. Another one's called LT Spice. Uh, it's again very very simple. I like LT Spice because it's just so simple. Like whenever I see software that looks like this. I get very, I become very excited and very happy because it's very like dumbed down and very simple. And again, you can just drop in components and then you run simulations and you see what the currents look like. The plots usually look like this. It'll show you some type of voltage or some type of current distribution. Um, and yeah, it's just an awesome software. So yeah, highly recommend LT Spice. Uh, I also have Arduino in here. Um, and oh, where are we? We are in the. So yeah, I have Arduino as well. And what, I, what Arduino is, it's basically a microcontroller um, that looks like this. And you can buy like uh, kits for it. So it's, it's basically a, like a little computer that you can plug into your computer. And then you can have a breadboard where you can plug circuits into it. And you can simulate things as well on the Arduino interface. Um, this is what it looks like. So this is also really nice because it combines hardware and software where you can basically call out specific ports like inputs and outputs. And you can basically tell it what to do. So Arduino is very, very beautiful. So if you're trying to learn electronics, I would learn Multisim slash LT Spice or Arduino. Uh, if you're trying to focus on software, like, like become a software engineer, yes, that is an option for electrical engineering, very popular option. Then I would strongly recommend you start out with Python. And if Python is like, uh, if, if learning software is very overwhelming, if running things through the terminal is overwhelming, then you can use a GUI, kind of like what my lab has, combination of Anaconda and Jupyter. Like this is what it looks like. So if I look up Python, Jupyter, it's a notebook. It's basically like a GUI that basically helps you and write some code, run some things, makes life very, very uh, much much easier. You can still um, you can still plot things on uh, in Python. Python is also very popular for plotting. It's very popular for doing like base math operations. Uh, it's also very popular for machine learning and, and and artificial intelligence. And that's simply because Python has a lot of libraries. It's a very popular language, very, very simple to use. It's kind of written um, with very simple syntax. That's why I would recommend it as the number one language to learn. However, if you want to be more hardcore, you're going to have to learn C and C++. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, C and C++ are lower level languages. Um, they, 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 um, they interface closer to the metal or, or, or to the transistors. Uh, if you're programming microcontrollers, you're often going to have to do it in C or C++. So these kind of, these are more electrical engineering programming languages, in my opinion, where Python is more upper level, more like on the software side. So if you're trying to interface more with computers, inputs, outputs, microcontrollers, things of that nature, C and C++ is a good uh, program. Uh, or if you're trying to do something that's higher level, that's a bit slower, Python works as well. Uh, C and C++ are also very good for writing advanced code. Like for example, let's say flight software. Like let's say you're trying to put code on a computer that's going to launch on a rocket or on a satellite or on like a highly sophisticated system. Uh, you're going to want to do that in C++, for example, compared to Python. Uh, again, just because it's going to compile much faster and it's going to run more efficiently. Now for something like telecommunications and signal processing, and again, telecommunications and signal processing is basically like if I have this phone right here and I want this phone to communicate with another phone, 
well, I need to encode my message in a certain way, and then I need to modulate it on the signal and do all that. I need to do some very, very fancy math. And I need to do a lot of these guys, these guys, Fourier transforms. Oh, Fourier transform. Uh, this is basically the father uh, of signal processing, Joseph Fourier. And I need to do a bunch of this math right here. And I need to basically take some signals and I need to transform them to the frequency domain and then I manipulate them and I do things with them and I filter some signals out. And what you can see over here is a bunch of plots. These are generated in MATLAB, I believe. And for that reason, you see over here that for um, telecommunications, again, MATLAB, Python, C++. However, I would still say MATLAB like 90%. Um, in my PhD, my group was very focused on signal processing. Almost every single plot that we generated was in MATLAB. Everything we did uh, was in MATLAB. And I'll give you guys some examples. Uh, for example, if I were to look at some papers that were written by me, um, let's say, uh, let's say for example, this one was written by me and my colleague, Sergi. Um, I want to show you some of the plots that we generated and how all of it really was done in MATLAB. Um, so oh, I don't know why my thing looks humongous <laughs> all of a sudden. So whenever we're doing like any type of math or some type of uh, like uh, how, how signals are behaving, this is all done in MATLAB. This is and these these values are all plugged into MATLAB. These equations, um, for example, calculating losses. Basically, we're trying to figure out how much loss is in here. Can this antenna communicate with the satellite? Uh, all this is done in MATLAB. This is MATLAB. This is MATLAB. Um, and this is just to show you again, very very brief example of how uh, MATLAB is just this very very powerful uh, software which you can do all sorts of math uh, using. Um, Python and C++ is again you, you can do things very very similarly, especially if you're trying to compile them. But I would definitely have MATLAB as the number one thing. Uh, if you're trying to specialize in antennas and RF circuits, then um, there is. ANSYS HFSS, and I actually, uh, I, I taught at Xavier University. I taught an entire course on this. Um, and I, actually, if you go on my channel over here, let me show you real quick. Uh, I have actual lectures on antennas using ANSYS HFSS. So if you go to playlists and you go to, um, I don't know, over here, we got lectures. you'll see that there is some bunch of lectures on how antennas uh, are behaving and simulations and things of that nature. So this is all done using ANSYS HFSS. Um, and um, this is also uh, one of my favorite ones, FICO, Altair FICO. If you're trying to simulate antennas, I would highly recommend the software. Uh, it's just so intuitive, so easy to use. If you're trying, for example, see like, let's say this is a phone, there's an antenna. How is the signal, how are the signals traveling? Say there's an antenna on the tip of an airplane. This is directional because I know the red means it's like very strong signal. How is that stuff uh, behaving? These are a bunch of different antennas and and how they behave and their and their profiles what whatnot. So let's say if I want to see like a monopole antenna, then I can see how like it behaves. And again, you build the structure and 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 you and you and you, and you do all these cool things. Um, so. Um, there's another one called uh, CST and HFSS, but basically these three different antenna softwares, uh, all, they're all doing the same thing. You're building some type of geometry and then you're simulating how the um, thing is behaving in free space and, and, and there's that. And then of course you have something like COMSOL, which is more advanced physics, I'm not gonna dive deeper into it. Uh, for embedded systems, um, this is something I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for. A lot of people who are more hardcore will use some of the more advanced microcontrollers. Again, I tend to want things that are very beginner friendly. I'm going to also recommend Arduino and to only focus on that. There are other things more sophisticated that you can use with like C programming language. But the nice thing about Arduino is that the software is much simpler and the hardware is much simpler. So again, if I go and I say like Arduino uh, alarm clock project, like then you can build something very, very simple and, and the, the, the inputs and outputs are all very, very laid out. You can buy one of these LCD screens and the software is just so, so, so nice. And I can't emphasize this enough. If you're an electrical engineer and you're, and you're a beginner, you're getting started with software, you want to go with the most user-friendly software possible. Again, in the case of pure software, that's Python. In the case of embedded systems, electronics, that is gonna be Arduino. Because even though Arduino is written in C++, it's a bit more difficult of a language. They have, again, all sorts of libraries and supports. And if I look up Arduino libraries, like there's just so, so many libraries that you can have for sensors, for IOs, and they have code that is like pre-written for you. So like if I say like, I don't know, 
like Arduino, um, inputs, um, code, I don't know, like digital read, for example, that's a function. Again, it's going to explain it to you. It's going to tell you what to do. It's going to give you an example code, which you can copy and paste into your thing. And then you can play around with it and say why it works, why it doesn't work. Uh, this is all very, very nice. Like, I, again, I really think Arduino is very, very underrated. You can get uh, pff, my my Amazon history is all about buying DJ controllers, which I will, I will talk about in a little bit. But if you buy, you can buy the 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 real one. Look, look at the reviews. This thing is insane. Or you can buy one of these like starter kits. And what's nice about them is they come with all these like sort of resistors and a breadboard and a controller and whatnot. And they have some projects that you can play around with. Um, again, very, 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 um, just, just you get, if you're trying to get into embedded systems, do yourself a favor, get yourself an Arduino microcontroller. Uh, if you're trying to dive deep into like, um, like, uh, microelectronics or, or you're trying to go into like actual hardware scripting, then you need the HDL and Verilog. Uh, now this is very different from software programming. This is like actually going in and designing things on the transistor level, like designing, uh, logic gates. Like, I don't know if you guys learned about these logic gates, but uh, you basically go in and you build these things from scratch and you build like an ALU, which is like an arithmetic logic unit. And you go and build something like that. Uh, you do that in something called v VHDL or Verilog. These are two different um, languages. Again, even though you're, these are not really software, they don't really like, you don't write software and compile it the way traditional software does. Here you're kind of directly um, changing the behavior of the hardware. Uh, these are all very popular with, using FPGAs. So if you learn how to program an FPGA, um, then that's, these are also, again, becoming very, very popular, especially for flight. Uh, if you want to go down that route, you will need to learn VHDL or Verilog. I believe Verilog is more popular. Although when I was in school, I learned VHDL. Um, and then if you're trying to learn photonics, if you're trying to get good at like using lasers and things of that nature, then I would say, um, again, ANSYS uh, has a photonics element. Uh, you could use Alter Fico. You could use the ray tracing. So, for example, if I do Fico ray tracing, uh, there are features in Fico where it helps you do things geometrically instead of using Maxwell's equations or current density to solve problems. And this can be really nice if you're solving like uh, problems relating to reflectors or lenses, which again can be used in the optical domains. Um, and then Ansys also another really good software. Uh, for photonics. There's, again, many others, more in-depth, more sophisticated ones. Again, this video is very beginner-friendly. This is if you're trying to get into it. These are the ones that I would start with. And then finally, if you're trying to get into networking, then multi-SIM is a really good software for that. And I'll show you an example of multi-SIM. Um, or, I'm sorry, not multi-SIM. I think it's called MS3 networking. Or... Um, Networking software. I actually forgot what the software was called. Uh, so multi-SIM can be used for networks, but these are like DC networks. Uh, for for here, let me look it up. Let's see. Uh, what was the paper? Um, Britain Jornet networking. Was it MS3? MS3, yeah, I think it was MS3. Uh, for some reason, I can't really find it on Google. Anyway, there's a software, MS3 Networking. Yeah, MS3 Networks. I think there's a software called MS3. I don't know. For whatever reason, I can't find it. I will put a link later for it in the description. But if you're trying to get into networking, then um, there's a software for that. I just I think it's called MS3. I'll have to look it up later. But you can still do it in multi-SIM. Now, that takes care of the soft skills. Um, let's. Uh, I'm sorry, that takes care of the hard skills or the technical skills and kind of the physics and fundamentals you need to learn. Let's dive deeper into the soft skills, right? And why are soft skills important? Soft skills is basically how to navigate life and how to make decisions and how you interact with other human beings. And if your soft skills suck, it doesn't matter how good your hard skills are or your software or, or, your, or your hardware or your physics or how good you are at electrical engineering. None of that stuff matters. You need to learn good soft skills. One, the most important soft skill is critical thinking, is to be able to think, is to be able to ask why. If your manager at work says, hey, let's design a tripod like this one, the very first question you should ask is why? Why are we doing this? What is the goal, right? And why can it, can it be done this way? Why can it not be done this way? Uh, you'd be shocked. This skill is in very short supply, even in engineering students, which is crazy. This is why companies like Tesla, SpaceX are very innovative. This is why someone like Elon Musk uh, can hire very talented engineers and they can do things that have not been done before because these people use critical thinking better than anyone else. 
um, what companies like Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing, they would always make these very expensive rockets and it was all very bureaucratic. And then a company like SpaceX came in and literally just asked the question, why do rockets cost so much? What do the materials cost? Why can't we make them cheaper? Can we build them in-house? Critical thinking is just basically asking why. Why are things done this way? You ask why enough times and then you come to a conclusion and you come to your own conclusion rather than just blindly copying what someone else is doing. Very important skill, critical thinking. Skill number two is problem solving. As an engineer, you are paid to solve problems. And I would argue you're only paid in proportion to the difficulty of the problems you solve. That's why someone who gets a PhD and learns how to design very complicated, um, I don't know, high frequency terahertz circuitry um, gets paid way more than someone who can only do basic DC circuits. Like the problems become much more difficult to solve and the outcome needed has a higher payoff. So you need to learn how to solve problems. Again, extremely important skill to learn. Third is communication. So you need to be able to take your ideas, convert them into words, and take these words and relay them to someone else. This is very, very important skills. How do you, how do you communicate? It's the most important skill. Um, if you don't know how to communicate your ideas to someone else, if you don't know how to do that in writing or verbally, you're, you're, you're screwed. Because how are people going to understand what's going on in your head? Again, you could be a genius, but if you're unable to relay and articulate your ideas to someone else, then what's the point? Opportunity detection this is a very important skill is when you're in school or where when you're at work, you kind of have to have peripheral, like large peripheral vision where you're able to constantly see where the opportunities are. Is there an opportunity for growth? Is there someone I could meet that can help me some, uh, with something? Is there someone that can teach me something? How can I grow and, 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 and kind of have your radar turned on for where things are happening? And so you can, able, you, you can spot them. This is also very important if you're trying to get an internship, or if you're trying to get a job, or if you're trying to get into grad school. You kind of always need to train yourself to be on the lookout for what is going on out there and basically going after it. Um, fifth skill, extremely important, extremely, extremely, extremely important. I cannot emphasize how important this skill is. You need to have tenacity. You need to have a high pain tolerance. Because in engineering school, you're going to get punched in the face quite a lot. You're going to be humbled every single week <laughs> with every single problem set. You'll be humbled with every single exam. You'll be humbled. With every single internship that you get rejected or ghosted uh, from, uh, you're going to be humbled. Uh, if, you, if you're someone who's like, oh, like this sucks. I can't do this. I'm going to switch to business. You're going to switch to business. If you're someone who's like, okay, this sucks, but I'm just going to keep going because I like this thing and I know it's what I want to do. And okay, fine. It's going to keep sucking and, and I'm just going to get through it. Like that level of like, all right, fine, fine. Like, like, like I've gotten punched enough and I'm still going to keep going. Like you need that. Without that, it's going to be very, very hard to survive. Now, I went over the technical skills, the base knowledge, and the soft skills basically that you need. Now, let me explain how you can go about learning these things. Okay. So, how to learn technical skills? One, pick a project, right? Um, very, very important. The, the best way to learn something is just pick a project. And let's say, again, going back to the Arduino example, if you want to learn how to do, um, I don't know, like an uh, alarm clock. Arduino, instead of watching endless videos on how to do it, just go buy the kit and try to build this thing yourself. And then you're going to get stuck and then see why you got stuck. And then you'll get stuck again and see why you got stuck again. And this process of critical thinking and problem solving and iterating on, oh, I'm trying to build this thing. My, my light is not working. Oh, why is that? Oh, it's not connected to the power thing. Okay. Um, well, why is it not showing the right text? Oh, I don't have the right code. Oh, let me go on Google and type and debug and see what's going on. You need to go through that process. And the way to do that is by having a project that you can finish end to end. Again, you can attend all the lectures in the world. You can watch all the videos in the world, but until you go and build something yourself and get stuck and get painfully stuck and go Google while you're stuck, um, you're not, you're not going to go very, very far. A very simple way to do that is to join a club or join a team or join a group of people who you can uh, learn from or learn things with and basically um, have other people around there to hold you accountable, okay? Very, very underrated. Obviously, once you've done these things and have something on your resume, one way to do it is also go get an internship. And ideally, you want to get a paid one um, and you want to go on the job and, again, be assigned a project and try to solve a real problem in the real world. That's going to be a, a, a real way to learn it. So, again, these three things are... I'm not, I'm not telling you to go read books. I'm not telling you to go watch endless videos. You have to go pick something and try to build it yourself. And it is through that getting stuck and solving why you got stuck 
you're going to learn those technical skills. You have to learn by doing. You have to build stuff. You have to you have to do it. You have to go through it. You have to go through the pain. Now let's learn. Let's talk about how you can learn soft skills. Um, again, one of the things that are most important I mentioned is communication. Talk to people. Talk to as many people as you want. When you go to supermarkets, talk to the cashier. When you go anywhere, talk to people. You go to an event, go introduce yourself. If that's very, very difficult for you, talk to people online. Join communities. Join our Discord group and go hit people up. Say, hey, what are you working on? What are you, what are you doing? Uh, I'm working on this thing. What are you working on? Hey, I'm trying to build this thing. What are you trying to build? Like, try to connect with like-minded people. And obviously, like, you, you can do it in a not annoying way. If you just, if you genuinely are curious about other people and you're trying to learn and you're trying to share what you know, people will talk to you back. That's a very simple thing you can do. Two is put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, this is where majority of growth happens in soft skills. You need to sign up for things that you are, like, unqualified to do. And what I mean by that is, like, for example, when I was, when I was an undergrad, um, I was uh, part of this like CubeSat team and we were trying to build this CubeSat and launch it into space. And I, at some point I was asked to be the, the, the lead of the entire communication subsystem. And I didn't know much about communications. Uh, I didn't know much about antennas. I didn't know much about radios, but I said yes. And it was so uncomfortable, but it forced me to learn the soft skills of knowing how to ask people for help, how to think, how to solve problems. Basically, I was in such an uncomfortable situation because I was in a leadership position basically working on something I had no idea how to do that in just few short weeks and months, I became a very, very good at it just through that discomfort. And again, going back to critical thinking, always ask why your mom asks you to take out the trash. Why professor says we should work. We should do this problem set. Why someone says we need to build this antenna. Why, why this antenna? Why not the antenna? And again, don't do it to be annoying. Do it for the genuine purpose of trying to understand why are things why do things happen the way they do right like if i have this tripod and i don't know like this thing is rotating why oh so you can have it from portrait mode to landscape mode like there's got to be reasons to do things people who succeed in life have reasons to do things and and think critically and they filter these reasons and the people who just go on mindlessly not knowing what they're doing they don't ask why okay now i showed you how to learn these skills Finally, let's go very quickly over how you can showcase them. And I'm going to briefly go over my LinkedIn profile to show you what you should do. And uh, again, you want to have your name, you want to have a title, um, and then basically you want to have your experience laid out. Now, in my case, obviously I have a ton of experience. If you don't have experience, that's okay. Just put like a project or put something. Um, like like don't leave this empty. If, if you have some type of club, project you worked on, some type of group, some previous internship, by all means, put that in here. And um, in my case, I, ha I only have like single sentences just because I'm very brief and I, I'm I try to get to the point. But use this section over here to explain more specifically what it is that you do. So use your experience to showcase your experience, obviously showcase your education. If you have any licenses or certifications, put them on. And then you have this project step. This over here should be stacked and you should talk about it in detail. Now, again, in my case, because I have too many projects, I, I remove the descriptions from them. But if you have one project, that's okay. One good project is great. Just talk in detail. Like go in here and say, I, I did X, Y, Z. I achieved X, Y, Z. I built this thing. I did this thing. I did that thing. And again, if you don't have a project, go pick a project and put it on. You want to talk about your projects. You want to do as much as you can. Um, things like scales and whatnot, I don't really care about them. Languages, I don't, I don't really think is very, very important. You want to also make posts, right? Like you want to tell stories, share your story with the world. If you achieve something, uh, uh, talk about it. If you do something, talk about it. For example, this was me going to a conference and I made a post explaining something that really cool that I learned from that conference. Uh, this was me. Uh, I made a video, for example, on my YouTube channel. And even though you don't need a YouTube channel, like just showcase some stuff that you're doing. Uh, in this case, I got my job at NASA and I made a post about it, uh, which is crazy. It got like over a million views and 16,000 likes. But the idea is that um, you don't need to get a job at NASA to make a post. You could, you could literally build a cool project and say, hey, guys, look, I made this. This is what I built, right? And then you can learn how to like tell stories and you can learn how to do all these things. This is basically as far as LinkedIn, as far as your resume. Uh, there's ways you can do that. So let's see if I can pull up my resume real quick. Let's say this one's from 2023. Um, again, you want to showcase it very, very well. You want to have your education for, well, obviously your name and your email. In this case, I have my LinkedIn profile. You want to have your education. You want to put your GPA in here. 
Um, again, experience. If you don't have industry experience, it's okay. Put projects, put some, put something. Like put, show me that you've built something and tell me what specifically it is that you have worked on. Um, in my case, I have some teaching experience as well. Uh, also in my case, I have publications. I have a lot of research papers that I've written. If you don't have publications, that's okay. Again, talk about your projects. In my case, I have skills in very, very simple lines. If you're someone who's just starting out, your skills section should be larger. Like say, hey, I know how to uh, write Python programming and I know how to use this library and I know how to use this framework and I have built this thing using it. Like basically you wanna lean on your strengths, right? You wanna use what you have. You may not have all this like community service, publications, technical experience. Again, my goal is not to brag about how cool and stacked my resume is. My goal here is to show you that I'm relying on my strengths. In my case, I have a lot of experience, which I mean, rightfully so, I've, I'm, I'm 27 years old. I have a bachelor's, master's, and I have a PhD. Like I better have a lot of experience. If you're someone just starting out, independent of how old you are, like you're not gonna have much experience. So you wanna rely heavily on a project or on a skill. You wanna always showcase what you have and you wanna connect with people and you wanna do all you can to, to, to connect with these people. Um, and again, if you find someone who's interesting, like let's say at a job that you're interested in at working, uh, do not be afraid to reach out, right? Like do not be afraid to send a message. Like if I, if I see someone in here and I'm really, really interested uh, in, 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 in hitting them up for some reason, like uh, I can just, I'll, I'll just go on their profile, for example, I'm gonna click connect and I can either send a note or send without a note. And then if this person replies, I'll, I'll send a message. In this case, I don't have premium, but if someone within my, my network, I'll send a message and I'll say, hey, my name is Ali. I am an engineer or I'm an engineering student, X, Y, Z. I see that you're work, working on this cool project. I see you also went to UB. Uh, this is a school, this is where I went to school. I'm curious to learn more about X, Y, Z. Or I'm curious what advice you have for me on this thing. Or I'm curious what opportunities you have for interns or for full-time engineering positions or things of that nature. But all in all, just to show that once you have built the skills, you need to learn how to market yourself. You need to learn how to like go and talk to people and 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 get get out there and get engaged with the world. And once you do that, then you basically will become golden. Um, with that being said, that's pretty much everything I had to cover as far as skills. I will go a bit more in depth. Again, if you want to learn more about antennas, I have like playlists over here. If you're new to my channel, I make all sorts of videos on engineering, electrical engineering, things of that nature. You can go to my playlist and figure out what it is specifically you want to learn. If you don't know what project you want to get started on, go watch this engineering internships video on how to get an internship, how to use projects to build skills for your internships. Uh, just do something, right? And if you haven't already, then go ahead and join our Discord server. Uh, I'll put a link for that below. Um, but yeah, with that being said, uh, that's pretty much it for this video. If you really liked it, leave a comment below. Tell me what you liked about it. Uh, tell me what kind of videos you want to see in the future. Uh, I do plan on more doing more interviews as well. So yeah, stay tuned. And there's going to be some videos popping up. Just click on them. Just go, go. promise me you're going to go do something, build some skills, build a resume, and I'll see you in the next video. Okay, peace, love.